Welcome to The Journey 2020. I'm Charles Morris. Happy to be here with you on this Monday coming off the weekend. And I do hope all is well. And as you know, as we're going through a uh, crazy time right now uh, through this pandemic and a lot of other things that we're being forced to deal with in a manner in which uh, a life and times in which we have never seen before in our generation, even though they're saying there's nothing new under the sun. I'm Charles Morris, and this is The Journey 2020, where we come to you every Monday at 7 p.m. We've been around since 2013, and um, from back in the day when I used to do a lot of work with my used-to-be co-host, that's Dr. Uh, John Robertson. He's the clinical psychologist here in the area, and he's the one who actually came up with the idea and the concept of The Journey 2020. And so he stopped doing the show maybe about three or four years ago. Uh, but uh, we here every Monday. We're on Twitter, Periscope, and Facebook, and so we ask that you please subscribe to us on the uh, uh, YouTube channel. Make sure that you hit the like button as well. We really appreciate that in this wonderful world of social media. And on the third Monday of every month, out of the offices of Dr. John Robinson, we have our very own clinical psychologist and sex therapist. She is Dr. Kathy Meek. She joins us here on the third Monday of every month. We have a lot of fun with her as well. And on the fourth Monday, we have uh, Haki Nakuma from Young Fathers of Central Florida who talks about uh, his great organization that he has nine programs within his organization to help young fathers as young as 12 years old on up to about the age of 27 understanding and stepping into the role of parent fatherhood so we all know that there's nothing more important than being a parent and if uh, Haki Nakuma is not here among us uh, we always have our very own life coach, that is Regina Johnson. She is, um, she helps us with our finances. She helps us to better understand uh, how to raise our credit scores, how to get away from some of the bad habits that we have, and uh, just, uh, just trying to do better in trying to understand how important it is to save money and to think about our senior years on down the road because uh, when we retire, we shouldn't be struggling. So we talk about money and how to handle that and deal with that and to get out of some of the debt and finance that we're in, our debt. So stick around for that. That's on the fourth Monday of every month. Uh, you know, during these times in which we are going through right now, it's very difficult and trying to put a, uh, I mean, I, I, you can't really put a label on it. It's, it's, it's history is being written, but that's every day. And as we see this uprising and what's going on in our country as we try to define it along with the pandemic and some other things that's, that we're, we're dealing with right now, we, I mean, I've done several shows on where we are mentally, emotionally, socially, and I tried to come from the spiritual side because I've had my pastors on, I've had other leaders on, and talking about how God is now touching people, and there's a response that we've never seen before. So the words haven't changed. There's nothing that has changed in the sense of our speeches, our passion, and our pain. So we've been saying the same thing forever in a day. But for whatever reason now that God has decided to do what he's doing the way that he's doing it and touching the hearts and the minds and the spirits of people, uh, there seems to be a little different type of movement in our culture and in the world today. Um, but with that being said, you know, over the years, uh, we, there's always been a conversation and many conversations over the years about the injustices of so many things when it comes to people of color. So the history has been written. There's nothing new, but still the, the battle is the same. Uh, the conversations are the same. The scars are the same. The pain is the same. But still, we rise. Uh, on today's show, I, I was sitting here and I was thinking about what we're going through. And then I also saw that there was a little something in the history that popped up. And I'd go like, oh, wait a minute. I'm familiar with that. I saw the name July Perry. And it was brought to my attention 
to someone that put on a play a few years ago. Now, we're very familiar with the Rosewood movie. Spike Lee and, um, brought to light uh, the movie, The Rosewood. But there's been many Rosewoods in this country, many. And I live near one that, and, and, and the sad part is, is that when you start talking about numbers, that's sad because the conversation should never be about the numbers. Because when you say, well, these many people died in Rosewood, and then somebody go, oh, well, these many people died in Okoye. It should never be that conversation. It's kind of like when Jewish people start talking to black people or black people start talking to Jewish people about the Holocaust and the people, well, how many people died coming over here? Those conversations should never take place because if one person died, that's one too many. We should never talk about numbers. We should talk about the fact that it happened and it shouldn't have happened. And so I called up my friend Glenn, and Glenn has been on the show before. It's been a long time since Glenn's been on the show, but I'm going to ask Glenn. I've talked long enough, and I'm going to ask Mr. Glenn Barbour. How you doing, Glenn? How you doing? Hi, Brother Charles. How are you? Man, you, I mean, you heard my speech. Uh, I want you to introduce <laughs> yourself. I know that um, you worked out of New York, and I don't know, was it the NBC affiliate or was it the CBS affiliate? Which one was it? No, it was, it was the NBC O and O. Okay. It's the uh, flagship station of NBC, WNBC. Okay. In uh, New York, uh, Rock in New York City. Okay, G give us a little history on, 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 on Glenn and, and how he got into the wonderful world of media. Give us a little history. Well, yeah, well, I am a, uh, I was born in Florida, but I was raised in Harlem, New York. And okay. um, my grandmother once said that she thought I would be a lawyer because I love to talk. <laughs> but I ended up uh, uh, becoming a part of uh, the broadcast industry, which um, I spent uh, nearly 40 years uh, in television news. And... Um, it was, I came up at a time in television news where we as blacks were supposed to be nothing more than window dressing. Uh, growing up in New York City, and of course, New York is the number one market in television. And uh, I thought I would be able to start in New York, but um, I couldn't. I had to go out into what they call the boondocks and work my way back, if possible. And uh, I started out in Augusta, Georgia, general assignment reporter. And uh, after a short time, I moved up to co-anchor their midday edition, the new news. Uh, but I wanted to be a part of the editorial decision making because as a reporter, you really don't make many decisions. You're told what to do when to do it, where to go, and many times what to ask. So I wanted to be a person who made a decision uh, by working behind the scenes on the editorial side. And fortunately for me, I got a job as an executive producer at the ABC affiliate in Youngstown, Ohio. And uh, there I was also charged with producing the six and the 11 o'clock newscast as well. And I was there for a while, and then I moved on to Little Rock, Arkansas at the CBS affiliate, where I was uh, uh, hired to produce the six o'clock news. But a short while after uh, being there, I was asked to produce the 10 as well. And there was a young man who uh, was producing the 10, a young Jewish man, out of Boston was producing the uh, 10. And when they asked me to replace him on the 10, let me just say this, Brother Charles, he was not happy. Okay. 
And, uh, but that's the way the business goes. And so from there, that was the 55th market in television's market. So um, when I was in Augusta, it was 106th market. When I went to uh, Youngstown, it was the 78th market. When I went to Little Rock, it was the 55th market. And after about a year, I thought I could really make a big jump and get into the major market. And fortunately, I was. I was able to go to Detroit, which was the seventh market. And uh, after being there for uh, a few years uh, as a newscast producer uh, and a field producer, um, I was asked by Adam Clayton Powell III was the news director of a new venture by ABC News and Group W called the Satellite News Channel in Stanford, Connecticut. And I went there as a producer, as a newscast producer. And uh, NBC became aware that I was there. And um, they were under the gun to bring a black into their newsroom on an editorial side. They had black reporters, but they didn't have black producers. And I went there. Uh, and it was very tough. But uh, because of my prior experience, I was able to deal with it. And uh, so I stayed there for a long time, and then I, I was ready to move on. You know, listening to you tell your story, because there were some, some things that you shared with me now that I didn't know, uh, which, is, which is great, because I would like to have you come back because I would, you know, I've, I've worked in news um, uh, several years and part of the uh, NABJ, National Association of Black Journalists. Mm -hmm. And I would like to have a little round table with you and probably maybe about two or three other people to talk about uh, how things have changed over the years and what really, to the best of our ability to try to explain our challenges and what we face um, just trying to tell the story the, the, the way that we think, we thought that the story should be told because they don't understand that there's a battle every day <laughs> in the morning when they meet and when, they're, when, when the producers and everything and when you go out, people just see what they see. They don't know what happened before that story aired or the story that wasn't told uh, how somebody told that story and some gathering go like, well, that's not how I would have told that story. But that's very common in that the people don't understand there's a battle that goes on on how the story is told. Uh, well, uh, I what think story I, should be told. Yeah, well, I think that uh, what the uh, television viewers don't understand uh, is what goes on behind the scenes. And to understand who are the decision makers. Right, exactly. What you see every night at six o'clock. And uh, I recall an incident when I was in New York City at WNBC. And um, it was when Jesse Jackson was running for president the second time. And the first time was in 1984. Then he ran again in 1988. And in 1984, uh, there was a controversy about him referring to New York City as Honey Town. And so what happened was that during the, between 1984 and 1988, Jesse Jackson had talked to Brene Brett, which is a big Jewish organization. They had mended and everything was fine. So in 1988, Jesse Jackson had just won Michigan and the New York primary was coming up and we were in an editorial staff meeting. I was the only black in there. And one of the producers said, we have to bring up Jaime Town. Now that was a dead issue, but he wanted to bring up Jaime Town simply because his words, I remember very well, was that Jackson cannot win New York. Now, this is a person that is supposed to be objective. 
But these are the things that go on, and uh, I vehemently objected to it. And I told them that I would not put that in the newscast I was producing. And they all looked at me as though I was crazy. But you see, uh, Brother Charles, I've done all of my work down through the years by one thing and one thing only. There's an old black Baptist song that I live by, my work live by, and it's this. May the work I do speak for me. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go around and defend my work, look at my product. And what a lot of my white counterparts do not understand is that it is about product. And what I learned in New York City was that the producers, every single producer, every single producer there was Jewish. Every single one. And when you asked the bosses why, their reply was, well, it just happened that way. Okay. But one of the things I learned, they didn't know what I know because, Charles, they didn't have to go through what I had to go through right. to get right. to where I was at. Okay. So what happens is that the big boss is up on the 64th floor at 30 Rock. There's only one color they care about. And that color is green. And the whites in there didn't quite understand that. So that's why I was very, very successful at WNBC TV in New York City. And I stayed there until I felt it was time for me to move on. And so I did. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, again, I think that um, part of what you just shared is part of what I wanted to talk about because a lot of people don't re don't know the battles that go on, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 it's everywhere. It's at every station. I don't care where you go, whether it's small, big, medium, uh, west, midwest, out west, <laughs> south. It's a battle yeah. every day. It's a battle every day. Yeah. Well, listen. Every day. And you know, and you know, one of the things when I was on air, I remember uh, sometimes I would, uh, when I was in Augusta, Georgia, I, and I was a young guy, I was a young kid, and I would fill in for the six o'clock produce, uh, six o'clock uh, anchor, co anchor. And it hit me one night, you know, while I'm reading a voiceover. I'm looking down in the monitor because it's the video over my voice. And all I kept seeing were blacks in handcuffs. Blacks in handcuffs. So when I got off the air, I said to the news director, I said, let me ask you something. Do any white people commit crimes in the city? Because you never see that. Okay. You know, and that was one of the things that prompted me to want to be a decision maker. Uh, in this in this business, and uh, again, as you move along, um, uh, they they expect for you, even as a newscast producer, to put things in the newscast the way that they want you to, you know. And I would always make them. I would do it my way, but I learned how to make it seem as though they were getting it their way. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's part of how we do what we do. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's yeah. And and yeah. for a young person, they don't understand what you just said, but that's what we've been doing probably since the since the beginning of time. But listen, yeah. uh, the reason why I wanted you to come on the show was because when the name July Perry came up, it came up. A few times over the past month or so and I said man you know with all of this that's going on now I said let me talk and call Glenn so let me backtrack a little bit I know you called me up and you said Charles I'm, I'm doing this play about this gentleman by the name of July Perry well I didn't know who July Perry was until you told me and then mm -hmm. after you educated me on July Perry and the Okoye massacre, uh, because we all know about Rosewood, 
for sure. Now, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to tell how did you find out about July Perry and what inspired you to do the play? Well, um, you know, I had been doing plays at my church for a number of years. And all the plays that I did were original plays. Right. I had heard some rumblings about July Perry, but it just came and went. However, there was a time when I started hearing a lot about voter suppression. And this was in uh, 2012 that I started hearing about it. And uh, I decided that I would do a little research. And my daughter and I went at the History Center. There's actually a library at the History Center. And if you call them and talk to the librarians and tell them what you're seeking, the day that you go up there, they will have an array of material and she and I went up there, and they had all kinds of stuff about July Perry, even his, his death certificate. They had um, newspaper articles from back in the day. We stayed up there for a few hours reading through everything, and they will make copies of things for you. And so I was hearing down here also in, in Florida about voter suppression. And I said, you know, that's... That's similar to what happened in 1920. You know, uh, they were saying back in 1920 that Negroes had not paid their property taxes, their poll taxes. Okay, so they can't vote when in fact they had. And in in 2012, they were saying that people have to have a driver's license to vote. And how do you get the driver's license? Well, the state said you have to have a birth certificate. Well, there are a lot of black people, particularly older black people, who do not have a birth certificate. And they were going to the motor vehicle department and they were being turned away because they didn't have a birth certificate. They couldn't even renew their driver's license. And one um, political person of color, I won't mention the name, said, well, you know, I, I can fix this. So they had a, uh, like an RV, a, a mobile unit of the, of the motor vehicle come up to a church and to help these people out. So I went up there my daughter went with me that day. And the very same people in that RV, that mobile uh, uh, motor vehicle, uh, 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 vehicle, were the same people who were in the office. So all the black people that were going in there, they were coming out the same way that they came out of the, the office. And so I started thinking about this, and uh, that's when I decided that I would look even deeper into the Akoi situation. And it was amazing. And you talk about Rosewood. Akoi was worse than Rosewood. And I decided to write a play about it called the July Perry story is the journey in reverse because it seemed as though the same thing that happened in 1920 was happening in 2012. And, and to be honest with you, Charles, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. It's happening in 2020. Okay. And what people don't know, you know, just like you were saying earlier, there were a lot of people from the north that's relocated down to Central Florida, many of whom lived in, uh, moved to Akoi, had no idea, no idea that there was a massacre in there and that 
black people just started moving back to a co around 1981. It's amazing. It's amazing. One day there were more than 500 Negroes living in a co The next day, there was none. Those who were murdered, they ran with chased off their own property. And right. that's what prompted me to do the story. So, so now you got to help us, Glenn, because now people are familiar with Rosewood because of the movie. Mm-hmm. You just stated that there were 500 people there and the next day they were gone. So now you got to help us understand what happened when Ju and I'll set it up like this way when July Perry and another gentleman wanted to go vote Mr. so Norman. take it from there Mr. and help us out and explain what happened okay, okay. well July Perry was a, a, a well-off Negro if you will uh, he owned orange groves he had a lot of Negroes working for him and when whites wanted Negroes to work for them, they would go to July and ask him, and he would provide workers for him. Now, the vote was coming up in 1924, president. He's a Republican. And July and Mose Norman were trying to tell the black people, listen, you need to register to vote. And they were rallying people to vote. Well, the Klan said this, and they were very clear about it. Any Negroes who try to vote brutal harm will come to them, and they meant that, okay? And what happened was when Negroes would go to vote on November, I think it was November 3rd back then as well, they were turned away even when they had receipts that they had paid their uh, 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 property taxes. They still, they were turned away. July Perry, he managed to vote. And um, as, as, as we portrayed in our play, he was at home one night with his family his wife and his two kids, and his mother lived there as well. They finished dinner. He was sitting there reading the newspaper when all of a sudden the Klan came to him and said to him, they called him outside. And that's exactly what you see in our our play. They called him outside. And they told him if he didn't come out, they were going to burn the house down and everybody in it. He grabbed his shotgun. He went out and got into a fight with them, and he killed two white people. They carried him off to jail. And then a group of white men broke into the jail. At least they say they broke into the jail. Took him out and they hanged him. Okay. Now, what we were able to do during our research is we found his granddaughter his actual granddaughter. Her mother was a little girl about six years old in the house the night the Klan came and got her dad. And so I was able to talk to her and my wife and I drove to her city and we spent the day with her, her family, and her son. And she told us this, that all the years her mother never talked about what happened that night. And she was around 90 years old one night. They were all sitting around the house. And she told them exactly what happened that night. How they got out, she, her brother, her mother, and her um, mother's mother or July Perry's mother, should I say, all got out and he cleared them out of the house because they were trying to break in the Klan 
when he went out there. And um, the fact that it was all about voter suppression, not a whole lot has changed today. Not a whole lot has changed. Well, well, and, well Lynn, there's, uh, yeah. there's, there's bits and pieces um, that was told that I can remember. One, there was um, a few people that, you, that were so afraid to go back that they wouldn't go back, and, and you understand why. But also, correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm trying to remember the part where the wife said that they came out the back and because it was mm -hmm. dark, the Klansmen were all around them and they were led by the moonlight based on, help me if I'm, I mean, correct me if I'm They were going the through the cornfields. Right? Yeah, right. They, got, they, went through the, they went out the back door and hid in the cornfields. Right. And it was his through the wife, grace of God. Wife. Yeah, it was through the grace of God because they're saying that they were all around them, but they didn't see him. But they didn't see him. Right, they didn't see him. That's correct. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they so, didn't see him. As the story was told was that God shielded them and protected them. And as they escaped because they said they were right there, but they didn't see him. Right. Right, because they would have killed them too. Right. They would have right. killed, killed them. And, and uh, you know, Mr. Perry knew that. And uh, that's why he got them uh, uh, out of the house uh, as quickly as he could. Um, can, you, can you talk about the gentleman too? Because was, it was him and another gentleman went to vote. Right, if I can remember the yeah, if I can remember you Mr. Norman. the story, it was him and another gentleman yeah, that went to vote. Right, yeah, he well he didn't vote. Uh, he got into a brawl with these these white guys, and um, they they really uh, they beat him up. And he went to July Perry's house that night and told them what happened. And you could see his face was all bruised. Um, but what he did was they encouraged him to leave town. He left. Uh, so when the Klan came to July Perry's house, Mr. Norman had gone. He had left. Okay. okay. Because they would have killed him too. Okay. So, um, uh, they just, I went that night. They went after all the black people living in all the Negroes living in a Koei. Uh, and those who didn't escape, and that's what they did, who ran off, they were killed. And I had heard at one time that there were 50 people killed. There were far more than 50 people killed that night, Charles. Okay. They ran those people. They took their land. And I will tell you this, and I, I'll... And I have, um, I talked to a lot of people who had relatives back there because they knew about the play because we were, we advertised the play on the radio and, 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 and people heard it, you know, as far as Gainesville, uh, I, I was, I got a call one day from a lady from Orlando who happened to be in Miami the day that we did the play. And she called me the following week and she said, I was in Miami and I heard that you were doing that play in Orlando. Okay. And several people have tried to get me to do the play over and over again. But um, let me just say this. Uh, I have made my introduction into Hollywood and uh, I, I, I will make a movie. There will be a movie about this. I can almost guarantee you that. There will be a movie about this because this is something that uh, you talk about what happened in Tulsa, the Wall Street, but there's a lot of people who do not know about a code, Florida. There's a whole lot of people in America that don't know about that. And so I think it's time that people know about what happened. And it's a bedroom community of Orlando. 
where Disney is, where Universal is. Once you, once you set up this clip, this, this 11 minute clip, once you, um, once you set up this 11 minute clip and we'll let it play. Well, this, this clip here is what I, what I wanted to show was there was this um, older couple who had been slaves. And when they were set free, they stayed on the plantation and worked on the plantation. And then they decided that they would leave. And they came to Orlando to look for a place to live. And they came in at a time when July Perry and Mose Norman were registering people to vote. And they asked, the old lady asked, what was going on? And July Perry explains that they are registering people to vote. And she said, you mean to tell me Negroes are going to be able to vote? And she had a husband with her who we showed his back. I don't think you'll see it in this clip. But he had whips all over his back from being whipped as a slave. And that's how we began uh, uh, the, uh, the play. All right. Well, let's check out this clip right here uh, from 2012. <laughs> Well, it's not coming 
All right, dear Glenn. Um, watching that, what what is it that uh, was running through your mind? Well, you know, uh, Brother Charles, when I see that, I get very emotional because it, you know, it it was a man who sacrificed for us, you know. Um, so that we can have our rights, uh, rights that still to this day have been de denied to us. Right. So. And, and so, you know, like the song says, the change is going to come. And, 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 you know, what we've just seen is a part of history. One of the things I just want to point out is the beginning, where you see the old lady who sings uh, a precious Lord, and she tells him, She's 85 years old, and she's never thought that she would see the day when Negroes would vote. When the day came to vote, and they went to where she and her husband had gotten the room, they discovered both of them had passed away. Mm. So they never actually saw the right for Negroes to vote. Okay. And, and well, let, me, so at, let me say this here, Glenn. Me. For those who's just tuning in, this is Glenn Barbour. We're talking about a play that he produced back in 2012, uh, the July Perry. And as Glenn stated earlier in the sh show, the struggle that July Perry faced. What year was that? It was 2000. I mean, two, I mean, 19. 1920. 1920. 1920. Um, and because he... hundred years ago. Right. And so he wanted to vote. And as we know about the movie Rosewood, uh, here, for those who are, don't know about, uh, here in Florida, there's a city that is really, people would consider it Orlando because it's in the county, the same county as Orlando. Uh, you may be in Okoye and think you're in Orlando. That's how close it is. And so there was a massacre that took place because this man wanted to vote. And as Glenn said earlier in the show, one day there's over 500 people there in the city of Okoye. The next day, most of them are dead and gone. The land has been taken. And so for a man who just wanted to go vote, he was killed along with many others. And so I was just trying to set it up for those who's just now tuning in and Glenn wrote a play back in 2012. And what was the title of the play again, uh, Glenn? The title of the play? It, it was entitled, The July Perry Story Is the Journey in Reverse. Right, right. What, what I meant by that is what happened back then is it happening now. Right. And so, Glenn, uh, I said that I wanted to ask you, <laughs> this is a different show, but restitution for the people, like, like, I give you a perfect example, right, because this country is so jacked up. So, as your president, and I say your president, uh, was in South okay, Dakota. All right. <laughs> all right. Okay. So, so your president was in South Dakota having this little thing, and there with uh, Mount Rushmore, right? So they yeah. were they were they were talking to one of the natives there, one of the Indians there, one of the natives, and he said, "These people came on our sacred ground and then built these white people with this monument of these white people on our sacred ground." As if, though, that's a good thing, you know, and the state in the mind of America, you know, and then the, the old story, somebody said, well, uh, Dancing with Wolves, have you seen that story? It's like, as you grew up, Glenn, you grew up, and what? The cowboys, they portrayed the Indians as savage, and they, they were just, just bad people. No. Mm -hmm. There was nothing wrong with the Indians. You came over here and you took their land. That's what that was about. They was just defending themselves, doing what normal people would do when somebody come over here and do what they did. So savages, and they was always portrayed as being the enemy and the bad people. But 
as you grow older and learn the history of America, and like they said on Mount Rushmore, sacred grounds of these people that they put up there and that they worship. But that's a whole nother show. The, <laughs> and asking, do you, oh, man, the land that was taken, and there's, I was well, they just, took I all mean, I'm, 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 I, I, no, 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 I'll yeah. just share with you. I'll just share with you. Three weeks ago, I was in North Carolina for my uncle's funeral, right? So I'm talking to his wife, my aunt, and we're, we're, we're on property that just in, in the backwoods of North Carolina. And she said, this land belonged to my family and there's acres and acres of land. And she said, what I did was I just called up my siblings and said, hey, we need to divide this land because I'm tired of paying property. On, I mean, the, the, the uh, uh, property taxes on it. You guys need to come, come in, decide who's what, where, where. But she told the story, Glenn, of her aunt that these white men just came there and took her land totally intimidated her aunt mm -hmm. and she said a few years ago she was just driving on the property and she said it was like four white men who came and said and asked her what are you doing here and she said this is my property and they was trying to tell her no it's not and she was like oh this is my property <laughs> i don't care what you say but this is my property and so they was trying to have that conversation of intimidation. And she said, well, y'all can say what y'all want to say. I'll meet y'all in court. And she said, and, and she had somebody else in the car with her. And, and the person who was with her was very intimidated by, it, by, by what was going on. And she just said, hey, I see you in court. And she just drove off and never heard from him again. But it's the same thing. So with just that alone, and the fact that they came and they took her aunt's property in the mass of just saying, I want your property. It, it, it's, it's, there has to be restitution in the sense of something of people coming together and recognizing that this happened and something needs to be done. That's just me. I'm just, you know, I just kind of threw it out there on you. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, 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 you know I, I, I agree with you because that kind of pat that's a pattern i mean you, you go way back and you think about uh the island of manhattan was bought for 24 dollars you know uh you know white people you know i ain't trying to start nothing but what i'm just going to say this is i would imagine that the um west oaks mall in the florida could have been built on stolen property. And there's a lot of property in in, in the city of Ocoee that was property that belonged to black people that were chased away and that land was taken. And you see what certain people want us to do is forget about all of that. And in terms of paying us, I, I, I'm not very optimistic about that at all. I, I don't think that that's going to happen. And when you have a, a, a president, like the one we haven't to mention, what happened in Mount Rushmore and, and, and what happened in Washington, D.C., and what he had to say, it's all very it's, it's divisive. And, and, and what he's doing, he's divisive. says the people are trying to destroy our history. Now, now, what he's doing is that he's saying black people are trying, or, or people of color are trying to destroy white people's history. But when you have these people who had slaves, uh, and, and one of the things, you know, you mentioned Spike Lee earlier. Spike has a company called uh, 40 Acres and a Mule. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because Abraham Lincoln, once he freed those who were enslaved, he said they all would get 40 acres and a mule. He was assassinated. Right. And his racist vice president wasn't going to do that. Well, and, no, Glenn, I don't mean, I don't, 
I don't want to cut you off. I'm going to let you finish. But I want you to imagine what this country, and I know you can't, what this country might be if Abraham Lincoln was not assassinated. Can you imagine? Well, it's, it's certainly... It. I, mean, I, I mean, think about his theory, and then think about the fact that he said what he said. We don't know if he meant it. But if he did, and then he's not killed. Can you phantom what might have happened? <laughs> but anyway, go ahead and finish. I'm sorry. Well, I, you know what? Just to touch on what you're saying is that uh, I don't think personally uh, much would be different because the thing is, is that if you're going to give all those who were enslaved 40 acres in the mule, that ain't going to happen. I mean, you could say it. But it's 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 just I I don't see anything like that. What well, no, no 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 I you meant know? no I meant I wonder how Abraham Lincoln would have handled the slaves if he had not been assassinated is what I'm asked, what I'm I'm commenting to of what may have happened and would this country have been any different than what it is now if he had not been assassinated is what I'm saying. Yeah. And, I mean trying yeah. to just because you can't really like phantom like this country really being fair to slaves. No, that no, that no, that wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let me just touch on something um, that's happening right now with, particularly with um, what happened with Brother Floyd in in Minneapolis, and you know, there's this movement. And in some regards, to abolish police and to uh, defund police, and 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 I, I I totally disagree with that. I disagree well, with that you're well, willing to abolish the police. Well, Glenn, I think okay. it's just worded wrong. I think it's just worded yeah. wrong because that's not what they mean by that. It's just worded yeah. wrong. You yeah. Know. But what I what I yeah what I want to say is this. I think that. Money needs to go into the investigation of these people who want to be police officers, okay? Because there are people who are getting slipping in through the cracks. Well, Glenn, Glenn, let me let me say this right here, and then I honestly, this is what I truly believe. I think there's something wrong with this country from the standpoint of this right here, and this is my this is just my theory. Nobody else's. This is just my theory. And I've said this on this show, and that is this right here. Glenn, in order for you to become a Navy SEAL, there's a certain qualification because the standard is set high. For whatever reason in our culture and our society, the standard of becoming a police officer is like low. So... Mm -hmm. If the standard was such as, and I'm not saying it has to be like a Navy SEAL, but because of what it represents to be a police officer, our standard of what that should mean should be higher. Brought to my attention who a former police officer who wrote a book about how jacked up police officers are and the reason why he said something to me that was, that made me go, hmm, one of those hmm moments. And he said, what other job in the world, in America, higher than the president of the United States, that you give the authority to, to go take out your billy club, beat somebody, let alone take out your gun and shoot somebody and kill them? Who else? has that authority. Now, you're going to give that power to an 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26-year-old? That's crazy. And the mere fact of what I'm saying is your standard of a police officer is way down here. Because what I have learned is when there is a foul play against a police officer, it's not the police officer. It's the uniform. It's who's wearing the uniform. 
Because, Glenn, you and I both know that we have been on, in many places on numerous occasions where we see a police officer walk in the room and we say to ourselves, boy, if something break out in here, we're going to be in trouble. Because we know that they're not equipped to handle the true essence of the situation and what it takes to be a police officer. The standards are too low. I don't care what nobody say. That's a real job that takes on real life situations and it, in a way it is a battlefield. But that's not our perception of it. When you give the right to these people to shoot and kill somebody who don't have a clue anything about life, let alone making a judgment and don't have the training, let alone people skills and knowing how to defuse a situation other than let me tase you or shoot you. That's all they know how to negotiate, let alone having a relationship with the people in which they're trying to protect. I'm sorry, well, that's I why, one of my tangents. Yeah. No, but that's why, I, that's why I say that, you know, it's not about the training as much as it is about the background check to check their backgrounds. Who are these people? That's what you need to do. That's where your money needs to be spent. You need to go back more than just two or three years on who these people are because you have these white supremacists today that are joining police forces, that are becoming correction officers. And once they get that badge and that gun, it's a license to kill because some of them you can't train. I don't care how much training you give, you can't train them because they are on a mission. And their mission, I mean, if you look at this man in Atlanta who shot the brother at Wendy's, he shot the brother in the back. You know, in the wild, wild west, when you shoot somebody in the back, you're a coward. Okay? And he shot this man in the back because well, that's where his mind was. Well, well, okay. well Glenn, I, you know what I said? I said, I don't mean, uh, well, the police officer, the, the retired police officer who wrote the book was on the show for that uh, segment talking about that. I've, I've had James on the show. He's been on the show some years ago, and he has a book called uh, The Shattered Dream and talking about law enforcement and the mindset. <laughs> And I told him, I said, James, either because I'm old or my mindset is when I'm dealing with him and we got into that altercation and that brother broke and he started running, I'm thinking, like, why? I'm, I'm not chasing him. I, I, I'm getting up and I'm on the radio. I got all his information. I got his car. I know where he lives. Why am I chasing well, you're him? Right. I mean, that's, I you're mean, right. that's, exactly. That's my way of thinking. I don't. I don't need to chase him. And let, let him run. I'll be like, what? That's you know, right. Okay. You're exactly uh, right. So, you know, um, whatever that calling in, and then then I go. I'm going over to Wendy's. <laughs> right. Well, you know, you know, you know. Um, um, I've heard some police officers say, "You know how many people I, I, I let get away who ran?" You know, and I had, and you know, because they, they got to come back this way again. So I'm not going to chase them. Right. Okay. It's, it's like the man in Minneapolis who had his knee on that brother's throat, on his neck, you know, for eight minutes and 46 seconds. He was killing him. That was it. He was determined to do that. And when you have a district attorney who says there's no culpable evidence to charge him, excuse me. And you know what? One other thing, Charles, is that. That district attorney, that white man in Minneapolis chose to watch his city burn down instead of arresting those white people. That's the choice that he made. Right. That, well, that's the sacrifice that he made. Boy, Glenn, okay. there's just something, there's just something about the color of this skin, man. It's, it's, it's deep, man. <laughs> it's, but it's beautiful, it, it brother. It is deep, brother. It is deep. But it's something beautiful, about the man. color of this skin. Okay. <laughs> Listen, and I tell I you tell what, you. you know something? What's that? White people have, white men have one thing, one thing and one thing only, and that is a gun. Outside of a gun, they got nothing. Okay. 
and that's why they hide behind their gun. And my son, who is a 36-year-old black man, I tell him this all the time. If a white man challenges you, walk away. Because the only reason they're going to challenge you is because they're packing a gun. Okay? Leave them alone. Okay? Because what they want, just like what happened in North Carolina recently, when the new... A police chief was a black man, and he got the radio calls from the white guys talking about we. There need to be a civil war. We need to get rid of all of them. That's their thinking. That's why they have those guns. Bring right. Al Qaeda over here. Bring yeah. ISIS over. Here. They'll fix them. Yeah. Did you uh, see the lady and the husband who pulled the gun on the on on the lady and her children? Did in you Detroit, uh, see that? Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. I did. Now, and, and then now here, this guy who worked at Oakland, Oakland College or Oakland University, or whatever, he done lost his job because he's because he did, it's stupid, just it's straight stupid stuff. But listen, I want to um, when you talking about a movie, uh, July Perry and the Okoye massacre, you need to you need to reach out to Netflix, man, because that looks that's a look like something that'll be right up Netflix alley. Seriously. Netflix. Yeah, well, one, one, one of the things, Charles, that I hope you'll have me back because um, I'm involved in a uh, motion picture project uh, right now in, in Hollywood, whereas um, we've been funded and we're just waiting right now for the line producer to do the budget and the shooting schedule. And as soon as that's done, and of course, it would have been done already had it not been for the coronavirus when everything, all the production shut down, but they're starting to gear back up. And, and, and uh, one other thing is that I'm starting to work on a play called The Untold Truth, The Murder of Emmett Till. That's wow. what I'm working on now. Wow. Yeah. Right. Well, that story and, and also, I don't know if you remember, I told you about the, the book called Take a Righteous Stand. You need to look at that as well. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. That's a that's a great story. That's a great story to take a righteous stand. Uh, so, l look into that. This is Glenn Bubbers. He is. Uh, it's funny because I was waiting for you to to tell us the 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 your church that you attend because you the the play was actually um, the I think it's three plays that I have been involved with. If you have been at your church, mm -hmm. uh, well, won't you tell them the name of your church? Well, it's Mount Pleasant Missionary Baptist Church, uh, and one of the things of Orlando. One of the things that I want to say that day of the play, our sanctuary holds about a thousand. On that day, we had squeezed in nearly fifteen hundred people, and and believe it or not, Charles, there were a lot of white people who came to see that play. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there. And I remember. I was there. <laughs> yeah. I remember after the play was over and a lot of people came down front to talk, I looked up and there was Shaquille O'Neal's mother standing up there. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. With that being said, Glenn, we're looking forward to your next project. Um, maybe I will get the phone call. I'm not quite sure, but uh, hopefully I will. So well, I you will. <laughs> You will, Charles. Yeah. Uh, I promise you. All right. Well, you know, you uh, got a pass, so a, a free pass. So whenever you want to come on the show, uh, you know, all you got to do is make the phone call. Okay, because I want to come back on uh, real soon and tell you about our uh, feature film that's going to be coming out. All right. That sounds great, Glenn Barbour. He is he, locally here in the Orlando area. Uh, we were talking about a play from 2012 July Perry and the uh, Okoye massacre that took place here in the Orlando area, which is Central Florida. Okoye is um, actually has grown quite a bit. Uh, the, part of it, uh, if you early in the show were talking about, there was some relative that he has spoken to of July Perry, and w got a lot of information. Also, um, they had brought back someone. Who was it that 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 came back? The grand, well, his someone, granddaughter. Right, right. The granddaughter, right. His granddaughter. Right, right. Mm -hmm. and, and here in Okoye, Florida, 
uh, which is really on the outskirts of Orlando, the July Perry story, the massacre of Okoye. We all know about Rosewood, and there have been quite a few of those towns that um, where many people of color were killed. Uh, and so uh, we were glad to have Glenn on to talk about what's going on back in 2000 and I'm sorry, 1920, was it 1920? 1920. 1920. 1920. The same thing is going on in the year 2020. So people know your history or it will repeat itself. I'm Charles Morris, and we want to say thanks to Glenn once again. Make sure that you subscribe to us on the YouTube channel. Make sure you hit the like button. We appreciate it. We're here every Monday at 7 p.m. And people, be wise. Don't listen to those people out of D.C. You better use some common sense. Watch your distancing. Make sure you wash your hands and your face. And be safe, and everybody be blessed. Glenn, be safe, man. It's good to see you. Thank you, my good brother. Thank all you. Right, Same all right, you. Glenn.